Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Orsi. I'm with PAR Corporation. I'm uh, just going to give you a brief introduction here. I um, might hold on. Oh, we'll get started. Um, so this is the initial public scoping meeting for the watershed project plan environmental assessment for the Bentley Creek watershed in Chemung County, New York, and Bradford County, Pennsylvania. Um, this is a, a meeting that's held at the beginning of the process uh, that we're using to explore potential solutions for for solving or resolving uh, the flooding problems along the Bentley Creek. Um, as indicated in the, the objectives at the bottom of the slide here, I uh, just wanted to highlight, we're gonna go over some potential measures, uh, a little bit about the process and uh, solicit uh, input from the, the public and other participants. Uh, but we do wanna highlight here at the, at the beginning that we're not here to talk about solutions or proposed approaches or preferred alternatives at this point. Uh, that's gonna come later in the process. Uh, right now we're focusing just on the process itself. Uh, before we get started, just wanted to go over some meeting logistics here. Um, so it is an online meeting. Uh, we're gonna ask everybody to stay muted throughout the presentation, uh, but we do encourage your input through the chat function. Uh, you should see a ribbon at the bottom of your screen uh, and you'll have a chat button that you can click, which will bring up a box and allow you to chat with either the um, everyone or privately to individual attendees. Uh, at this point, we would like to ask everybody to go to that chat box and sign, use it for a sign-in sheet. And if you can just add your name, your email address, and your affiliation to the chat box so we can have a record of everybody in attendance. All right, so we will uh, keep going here while everybody finishes putting their information into the uh, the chat. Uh, to start it off, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, uh, Mark Watts with the Chemung County Soil and Water Conservation District, uh, just to give us a brief introduction to our sponsors for the project here. Mark. Thanks, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I know Daryl Miller we have from the Bradford County Commissioners joined us. Um, I'm not sure if Kathy's with us from Bradford County Conservation District. I know Joe was on this morning. I talked with Deborah Lewis. I thought she was going to be on. She's the mayor of the village of Wellsburg. Uh, Vern Robinson is the town of action supervisor. He did contact me late earlier today and had a conflict with tonight, but I told him that this was being recorded and I thought that, that I would be able to get him a copy. Um, from the Schmunk County Legislature, I think they're David Manchester. Um, and our county executive is Chris Moss and Dave Sheen is our deputy. David was gonna to try to come on. I'm not sure if he made it. And then myself is representing Shimon County Soil and Water. Um, but we'd like to thank Daryl for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good evening, everyone. And, and thanks for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, my name is David Wolosi. I'm the NRCS uh, representative for New York. Um, Heather Smeltz is, is with us as well from Pennsylvania. Our consultant team, uh, we have Alan Orsi, Vice President of Pear Corporation, and Sandy Lair, the NEPA Specialist with Tetra Tech. In addition to uh, Alan and Sandy, the consultant team includes a wide range of engineers, scientists, and planners, both from Pear Corporation and Tetra Tech. Um, ag again, we will hear shortly from uh, Sandy Lair and Alan Orsi. Okay, uh, presentation overview. I'm gonna cover the planning team roles, project background, outline of the pre uh, planning process, and then we'll have an open discussion. So the role of the local sponsors, as, as Mark Watts indicated, uh, there are six sponsors for this project, both from Pennsylvania, uh, Bradford County, and uh, uh, represented or sponsors on the New York side in Chemung County. Uh, the sponsors are responsible for permits, 
long-term operation and maintenance, land rights acquisition, and utilities. The role of NRCS, as we are the primary administrator of this project, we will uh, conduct the final review of project documents prepared by Para Corporation and Tetra Tech. And we're also responsible for coordinating with uh, the public, uh, tribes, and government agencies. The role of the engineering consultant, uh, again, Para Corporation and Tetra Tech, is to conduct field reconnaissance, gather background data, complete the engineering analyses to characterize the watershed, develop and evaluate potential flood prevention strategies, and prepare the final project documents for NRCS. Throughout the process, NRCS will provide a review and concurrence of the consultant's work. So why are we here? I'm gonna cover a brief history of the project, why this is a new project, and how does the process work? Uh, the Bentley Creek watershed has historically been flooded. We know that over the last 90 years, there's been 11 significant floods within uh, the village of Wellsburg. Uh, next, a couple of photos from 2011 uh, in the, uh, within the village of Wellsburg. Okay, uh, the 1954 Watershed Protection and Flood Prevention Act Public Law 83-566 authorizes the Secretary of Agriculture to provide technical and financial assistance to local organizations for planning and carrying out watershed projects. This program provides for cooperation between the federal government and the local government entities that include states, counties, uh, villages, towns, et cetera, to work together to prevent erosion, flood water, and sediment damage, among other purposes. Nationwide, NRCS has worked to plan and implement over 2,000 PL-566 projects, which include over 11,800 watershed dams. In New York, uh, we have implemented uh, 31 projects. Just over half we were used to install 59 flood control dams and four flood control dikes across New York State. The main purpose of the rest of the projects was watershed protection that included land treatment. Uh, for Pennsylvania, prevent, uh, Pennsylvania had has implemented, planned and implemented 60 PL-566 projects. Approximately half included 80 to 85 flood control dams across Pennsylvania. The main purpose of the rest of the projects across the state included both acid mine drainage projects as well as watershed protection land treatments. A little bit about the history of this project. Uh, the first application to NRCS was in 1965. Uh, over the next five to uh, seven years, uh, there were two feasibility reports, um, neither um, Neither of those reports indicated that the project was uh, was feasible, so it did not move forward. Next slide, please. Um, so in 1994, uh, there was a series of flooding events highlighting, highlighting flood damages. And in 1997, a third report was conducted and the project was determined to be potentially feasible, which elevated the planning um, the planning process. Uh, in 2002, planning began, and in 2012, the, uh, the draft plan was completed. Uh, however, there was no funding for watershed and flood prevention operations program. Fortunately, in 2017, uh, there was funding for the program, and in 2019, and actually July of 2019, Shimon County Soil and Water Conservation District took the lead as, as the administrative sponsor and requested federal assistance under the Watershed and Flood Prevention Operations Program. And ultimately, the, this project was funded in October of 2019. So why the new projects? Well, we know through over the past 90 years, there's been 11 
major flood events or significant flooding events in the village of Wellsburg. And with the addition of uh, funding to the Watershed and Flood Prevention Operations Program in 2017, um, that's why we're here. Again, in 2019, the sponsors requested funding and were approved in the fall of 2019. So the watershed project plan, uh, there's some significant components. Uh, first is a feasibility study in which we, NRCS, uh, we basically do a sponsor check and determine whether or not the sponsors meet the requirements in the National Watershed Program Manual, Section 500, and to determine whether the sponsor is ready, willing, and able to move forward with planning, design, and construction. In addition, we look at econ the economic feasibility do we have net benefits, the social feasibility, and the environmental feasibility, both of which uh, Sandy Lair will cover later in the presentation. Okay. The watershed planning process, um, there's a, gonna cover a rough timeline, and then we're, Sandy is going to go into the purpose and need and um, the planning outlet, the, the NEPA process, the human and environmental resources. Um, Alan will cover the overview of the project area and flood prevention and damage reduction potential solutions. So this is a very rough timeline. Planning takes approximately two years, followed by design, which can take one to two years and construction is typically two year process. <laughs> This process, as you can see, takes a long time. Um, it is deliberate. It is an, an intentional process. And the, the you know the crock pot in the lower right is basically to give you the idea that uh, it does take time. We get a better product when we are deliberate uh, in our processes, and it we get a better product than the typical microwave. So with that, I'm going to hand it off, this off to Sandy Laird to speak about the planning process. Thank you, David, and good evening, everyone. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, as David said, I'm gonna talk a little about the overall planning and environmental review process, and also about the topics that will be covered in the environmental impact review. Um, we start with the purpose and need for the proposed action or project. Uh, the purpose is to reduce impacts of flooding in the Bentley Creek watershed in the village of Wellsburg in the town of Ashland, and also in Ridgebury Township in the communities of Ridgebury, Centerville, and Bentley Creek. Um, and the proposed action is needed because of the repeated flooding that causes damages to homes and uh, infrastructure in these communities during uh, periods of intense rainfall. The uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service is uh, seamlessly combining the planning process uh, with the environmental assessment process in compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. Um, the Council on Environmental Quality Regulations for implementing NEPA uh, uh, can be found at Title 40 Code of Federal Regulations, Section 1500 to 1508. NEPA requires review of the effects of all major federal actions, including federally assisted actions, such as those funded with federal dollars, uh, and and actions that require federal licenses, such as environmental permits. NEPA uh, is not just required when projects have significant impacts. Um, the level of detail of the environmental review varies with the uh, likelihood of serious impact. The planning process overall uh, will culminate in a document that will be called uh, a combined plan environmental assessment. Um, the purpose of this planning and environmental assessment process is intended to inform decision making um, and, and decision making after considering a variety of possible alternatives to meet the purpose and need, and also uh, after understanding the environmental consequences of the possible alternatives. The NRCS planning process also involves, once the plan is implemented, 
a follow-up and evaluation of the effectiveness of the plan to meet the originally intended objectives. In addition to NEPA, uh, other policies and procedures will guide our integrated planning process to consider and present different alternatives, including the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources Conservation Service documents shown on this slide. Um, we will follow these principles, requirements, and guidelines, and the National Watershed Program Manual and Handbook to consider alternatives and solutions that are defensible from a technical, economical, environmental, and social standpoints. Some of the goals and factors of consideration will include um, likely some structural measures for floodplain management, flooding management, and also a combination of other measures to enhance public safety related to flooding. And Alan will go over those um, uh, a little bit later in this presentation. Um, but in addition to that, um, some of the other goals are protecting the functions of the natural systems as well, including uh, resiliency of ecosystems. Another necessary factor for solutions uh, is to optimize the public benefits uh, relative to the costs. And that, that's needed to allow the federal funding to be granted uh, cost effectiveness. Um, in accordance with these guidelines, um, We'll look at the problem and the solutions from a watershed and regional context, as well as a site-specific context. And we also will address uh, risk and uncertainty with the plans, uh, and, and finally propose any mitigation, uh, mitigation that may be needed for any unavoidable environmental impacts that may result from the plan. So what will the NEPA and planning process address and what info will be documented in the plan EA? The plan EA will document, uh, document will um, first identify the purpose and need. What, uh, what uh, purpose does the plan address? Um, and it will ex explore different alternatives or ways of addressing the needs. It will analyze and compare the environmental impacts of, the, of different alternatives and it will consider econ economic benefits and costs when selecting the preferred alternative. And based on the results of the planning and NEPA analysis will inform the decision of which alternatives to pursue and how to implement them. This process also provides opportunity for public participation and comments throughout the process. We're involving and inviting uh, government and local agencies and the general public to provide input, uh, including through this scoping meeting and the scoping period, and also uh, at our next meeting when the findings and recommendations of this study process are presented, and also through commenting on the draft plan EA when it's released for public review. So public participation is a big part of the NEPA process, and uh, there are multiple times specifically designed for agency and public input by attending, um, attending meetings, um, reviewing documents to get information, and also by providing your input through opportunities to comment at various stages. The best way to stay current on project progress and be informed of key comment timelines is to get on the NRCS's mailing list for the project. Um, there'll be periodic updates, and uh, also you can check the NRCS's website uh, under the Bentley Creek Project, and it will give you updates as the study progresses. Okay, so for this slide, um, just spending a little time, where we are in the NEPA process right now is basically the first orange box on the left, public scoping. We're currently uh, in the process of uh, identifying interested parties and notifying agencies and general public of the intent to do this study uh, and environmental assessment. Um, scoping is the process to collect information uh, on the environmental or other issues of concern around a, a project. And normally it's a 30-day process when comment period is open for you to submit your input. You can help shape the project during the scoping process, um, it's where you can be the most influential to a project's design and development. Examples of scoping input from you could be 
um, requests to modify the project's objectives for purpose and need, um, requests to study alternative ways to meet the stated purpose and need, um, requests to create project design features, specific ones, um, such as though even those that those can reduce adverse impacts to environmental resources or or certain public functions like road management, for example. And you can also submit uh, relevant scientific literature if you think it will help with the review. Um, in this process, your familiarity with the local issues can enhance the study and ultimately the project outcomes. Um, next box, second from the left, we will be preparing the draft plan environmental assessment document, basically using comments received during the scoping process, along with information from our own studies um, and also publicly available in information. We'll be developing uh, and evaluating alternatives, um, analyzing the impacts to those alternatives, or I mean, environmental impacts resulting from the alternatives, and then preparing the EA, um, which will also be developing measures to minimize impacts to environment and social resources. <laughs> So uh, then when the draft document is ready, there'll be a, not, a public review period of about 30 days. Um, that will be the middle orange box now. Uh, and again, that would be when the public and agencies can review the document, provide comments to the project team, and uh, we'll notify the public when this review and comment period will be for the notice of availability. It'll say uh, how and where to access the document and also how and when you can submit your comments. Um, and then the next two steps, uh, uh, next rightmost boxes are to finalize the plan EA. Um, and at that point, we'll address all agency comments received on the draft document and then finalize the plan EA. And um, then finally prepare a findings statement and decision document. Um, such as a finding of no significant impact, impact if applicable. So um, an overall of the planning and NEPA process includes, uh, in addition to this scoping meeting and the scoping process, we'll have data collection uh, and assessment, including uh, environmental resource inventories and a watershed assessment using both field review field review and computer modeling, as well as publicly available information. Um, we'll also be conducting social and economic assessments. And with the understanding of the issues and information from these assessments, we'll go ahead and formulate the alternatives, uh, to ways to remedy the flooding and flood damage problems. Um, and then we'll evaluate the alternatives, and that will be done from a standpoint of uh, both effectiveness, environmental impact, and cost. And then uh, once, we've, once we've gotten to that point, we'll again notify the public and, and hold another public meeting to go over the results of the study, including uh, the preferred or recommended alternative. Okay, and this slide shows a list of the environmental resource topics that we currently plan to be covered uh, in the environmental assessment document. It's similar to many other EAs you may have seen for other projects. Um, yeah, of course, each project is different and unique. You can take a look at these uh, topics and then as you listen to the rest of the presentation, keep them in mind. And if you have any input or questions or comments related to them uh, or any other issues of concern, we welcome you to submit them during the scope of scoping period. So at this point, um, I will be handing the presentation over to Alan Orsi of our PAR Tetra Tech Consulting Team. Um, Alan will be going over the hydrologic modeling, uh, which is the basis for, the, for our study and planning, as, as well as um, he'll go over the different types of flood damage prevention strategies available uh, and, and then uh, and all that fun stuff. <laughs> so, okay, Alan, thank you, take it away. All right. Thanks, Andy. Um, so as Andy mentioned, a significant portion of the technical component of this project will revolve around the, the H&H &H study. 
uh, or the hydrologic and hydraulic analysis. As part of today's meeting, we want to provide a little bit of a high level view of what, what this means. Uh, so the study really starts with evaluating the watershed or the, the total area that drains to a point. Uh, for this study, the watershed is defined as the land draining down to Bentley Creek at the uh, confluence with the Chemung River, uh, located just over the Pennsylvania line into New York, uh, just north of Wellsburg. Uh, based upon available topographic data, this area covers, uh, I think it's about 52.3 square miles of land, uh, extending about 10.4 miles south uh, into Pennsylvania. And really, New York uh, 367 and PA uh, 4013 run pretty much down the center line of the valley with the drainage area extending about two and a half miles on average, plus or minus to each side. Uh, the watershed includes the, the main stem of the Bentley Creek, uh, as well as a, a, a number of different tri tributaries, including uh, Buck Creek and, and a number of other um, sub watersheds. So to understand each of these watersheds, uh, we subdivide the watershed into a number of different uh, components. Uh, for the most part, uh, these can be defined by where each of the tributary creeks runs, uh, run into the Bentley, Bentley Creek. And then based upon the drainage area, hydraulic, hydraulic uh, this, excuse me, the subbasin area, um, a hydro, hydrologic model can be built for each of the subbasins utilizing a uh, program for this project that we're using is H HEC HMS, that's uh, the Hydraulic Engineering Center Hydraulic Modeling System uh, prepared by the Army Corps of Engineer. And what this program does is it accounts for the, the land use, whether it's uh, developed, uh, paved, wooded, farmland, as well as the slope of the terrain to provide a prediction of how uh, when water falls down onto the, the ground, how that water is going to either infiltrate or run down, how quickly it's going to run down, and how much flow that's going to generate in the tributary streams. Uh, for the purpose of our study here, both existing land use as well as future land use will be considered. Uh, and that's so that we don't just get an answer for what's going on in the watershed now. Uh, we're going to be able to design this to have a measure of resilience so that and not only works now, but also at some point in the future. Uh, while the future land use is going to be considered, uh, we do acknowledge that there is, or that there might not be a significant difference between the, the existing conditions in the watershed and the future conditions for this specific watershed, uh, mostly just because of the amount of preservation and um, land use restrictions within the Bentley Creek watershed. So once we get this hydraulic model together that tells us how much water is coming down into the Bentley Creek, uh, we can then develop the hydrologic model. Uh, and that's going to tell us how that flow is going to pass through our, our study reaches. And this is going to be completed through the development of a HAC RAS, or um, the Riverine Analysis Program, available from the Corps. And what this model does is it uses available topographic data uh, supplemented with some site-specific survey and data collection. Uh, that will complete as part of this study to predict how and where the water is going to flow through through the given study reach. Um, the model can be utilized to predict flooding for a variety of storm events. Uh, we'll look through through a number of storm events, uh, but really focusing on the 100-year storm event for our study here. Uh, so as an example, on the right here, we have an aerial image of Wellsburg. And uh, what the modeling will tell us is what the limits of the flooding might be during a severe rainstorm event. Uh, so what we have on the map now is orange. It's indicating the limits of the 100-year floodplain. And then the red fringe is showing the additional flooding that will result from a 500-year storm event. Uh, similarly, going a little bit upstream to Ridgeberry, uh, again, the aerial view and then overlaid with the predicted flooding. Uh, one thing I do want to say with these, uh, these overlays right now is that they are preliminary in nature. Uh, we did some early... Uh, modeling of the watershed and the the hydraulic developing of the hydraulic model uh, so that we could better target where our data collection needed to be uh, to support the, the model refinements. Uh, then lastly, moving further upstream to Bentley Creek, again, the aerial photograph and the overlaid inundation for the 100-year and the 500-year storm events. Um, once these models are developed, refined, and calibrated, uh, they provide a, a useful tool for determining where the flooding is going to go, how high it's going to go, how fast it's going to go. Um, they can then be modified to assess the effectiveness of various flood mitigation strategies. 
Uh, we also understand that sediment is a concern in this, uh, in the river. Um, sediment can be a concern because it's going to impact the, the channel conveyance capacity and ultimately impact the peak water surface elevations and result in flooding. Uh, so with that in mind, the planning study does include development of a qualitative assessment of the um, geomorphological uh, movement of sediment through the, the river, and that's going to help inform future decisions for managing sediment in the basin. Uh, so now we can talk a little bit about some flood mitigation strategies that can can be considered or will be considered as part of the study, and they can really take um, many forms. Um, typically, the selected approach isn't going to be a, a single solution, but rather a combination of two or more uh, variations of these mitigation strategies. Uh, but we'll just break them down into the these primary uh, five categories for for discussion purposes. So the first of the strategies is flood volume and rate reduction. Uh, the most visible of this type of strategy, or I guess the largest scale, would be a flood control dam structure. Uh, David mentioned that there were uh, 85 projects, I think it was, in Pennsylvania, and I forget his number for, for New York, but there's a number of these flood control dams around both states. And what they do is you just have an earthen embankment typically with a smaller diameter pipe through the bottom of the dam that allows the regular stream flows to come through. And then when you have a rainfall event, the water will back up behind the dam uh, and the pipe will, will, um, will attenuate flow and reduce the amount of flooding that occurs downstream and then slowly reduce that extra water over the next 10 days or so. Uh, the dams are often dry. They have no impoundment behind them during normal pool, uh, but they have been designed to be dry as well as to have a, a permanent pool that can be used for recreation or other purposes. Another approach for flood volume and rate reduction is infiltration, stru infiltration structures. Uh, so pictured here on the left is an example infiltration trench uh, where you have a, a trench that was excavated into the, the hillside here. Uh, and then you backfill it with a geotextile fabric with crushed stone and a pipe. And then to the right is a schematic showing what this is what this is really doing here, right? So you have the rain falling on the roof uh, under normal circumstances. That rain would run off into the, the streets, into the woods, eventually to a river and uh, down to the, the area of concern. Uh, what the infiltration structure does instead of uh, passing that water over land into the receiving streams, uh, passes it into the trench. Uh, the trench will then infiltrate it into the ground and reduce your your peak flow to the downstream area. Uh, land use zoning and watershed protection can also help alleviate flooding concerns. Uh, what this would do is transition land from a, a high runoff use, such as development, to a lower runoff use, such as forest or, or grassy vegetation. And again, just giving that water more chance to infiltrate into the ground, uh, slowing down how fast that water accumulates in the rivers and moves to the areas subject that are prone to, to flooding. Uh, we do acknowledge that for, for this particular study, that current land use and a large percentage of the drainage area and the clean and green program, um, this approach really may not be all that applicable, uh, but we'll at least consider it from a, a qualitative standpoint, uh, just to make sure we're doing our, our due diligence to cover all of our bases here. So the next flood mitigation strategy here is avoidance. Um, avoidance includes mitigation strategies that physically remove the threatened property from the floodplain. And this may take the form of a, a buyout where the property is, is purchased from the owner and then raised, that's raised with a Z. Um, could also be horizontal relocation where the building could physically be uh, picked up and moved to somewhere that's not within the uh, or below the base flood elevation. Uh, elevating structures or vertical relocation is also a possibility. Uh, this is basically you take the, the building that's within or below the base flood elevation, uh, you jack it up so that the living floor and the uh, occupied floors are above the base flood elevation, and then you build a new basement underneath it that's going to be um, designed to be resistant to flooding, uh, thereby mitigating the hazard exposed to that structure. Uh, the next mitigation uh, strategy here is flood proofing. And two types of flood proofing are, are, uh, are available. Uh, the first is dry proofing. And this is where you're taking the existing building and wrapping it in some kind of impermeable uh, treatment 
so that if the water comes up around the building, it will stay on the outside. Usually this is going to involve some kind of closure detail at doors or other low openings in the building, and those would have to be placed during or installed during the flood event. The other kind of flood proofing would be wet flood proofing. And this is really retrofitting an existing building, taking all the mechanical equipment or other um, property that may be subject to damage by flood water and moving it up to a portion of the building that's above the base flood elevation. Um, so barriers can really take two primary forms uh, as shown here. On the left side of the house, we have a, an earthen levee. Uh, on the right side of the house, we have a little flood wall. Um, Levees can often be an effective solution to protect a, a flood prone community without the need to implement flood, flood proofing at multiple structures. Uh, so I think the last uh, mitigation strategy that we have here is drainage improvements. And really what this is looking to do is increase the conveyance um, of the, the channel that's carrying water from, from the drainage area down to the downstream uh, rivers. Um, options under this strategy include enlarging stream crossings, uh, including culverts. Uh, this will effectively reduce the water surface elevation upstream of the culvert and thereby reducing flooding upstream of the culvert. Uh, it can also serve to let early flood water through the system so you're not filling up the, all that flood storage in the floodplains upstream of the culvert, and that way it's available for the peak flows later in the storm event. Uh, while a wider culvert can be used to increase flood conveyance, uh, raising of a bridge deck or culvert roof can also improve conveyance. Uh, this not only improves the conveyance of the channel, but it can also be designed to raise the bridge uh, and uh, effectively raise the road above that flood elevation. And that way you can pass more water through and you're also removing that, that bridge and that roadway from being flood prone uh, so that it will be available during the storm event. Uh, conveyance can also be improved by widening channels. Uh, this is really just uh, digging out the bank and making that channel wider so you can move a, a larger volume of water downstream and not have things back up so much in the downstream areas and result in flooding out of bank. So finally, we did want to note that green infrastructure uh, not only provides water quality improvements, but it can also be leveraged to implement some of the flood control or flood mitigation strategies that we discussed on the previous slides. Um, stream channel stabilization and repairing corridor improvements can be utilized to, to promote bank stability. Uh, this can reduce the sediment load to the downstream reaches, uh, and thereby improving flood conveyance and, and limiting the, the amount of flooding that's experienced. Uh, stormwater controls can be implemented to treat stormwater. Uh, so this treatment uh, typically involves some kind of detention period. Uh, so that detention period actually has a, a couple benefits to, to stormwater runoff. Uh, so beyond the water quality improvements, uh, you're also going to introduce the degree of infiltration that may not have been realized if this water was just allowed to, to wash off site. Um, and it also provides that detention uh, so that you're, you're flattening out that peak curve come, or the peak hydrograph leaving your site. Uh, so it's a more steady flow and you don't have quite as high peaks. So with these strategies in mind, the question is, what are the next steps? Uh, first, we want to encourage feedback and input from everyone in attendance uh, this evening. Um, the planning process isn't about us engineers sitting behind our desk and coming up with a numerical solution that we think is going to look great. Um, it's, it's really about working with the community to find a solution that's right for them and provides a, a meaningful, yet cost-effective and re, uh, responsible solution to the known flooding concerns. Right now, we're in the process of developing, developing our hydrologic and hydraulic models, uh, collecting additional field data, and defining and working to better understand the, the problem of the flooding and what we can do. Uh, so from there, we'll review uh, the breadth of alternative solutions uh, using the mitigation strategies that we, we just talked about on the preceding slides. Uh, and from there, the watershed plan will be developed and finalized through the planning process, uh, incorporate input from various uh, governing agencies as well as the public that participates in the, the planning process. So those are the next steps in the planning process. So I will turn it over to David, who's going to wrap up some next steps and discuss how we hope you'll participate in this planning process. David? 
Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> Good evening again. Uh, this is David Woloski with NRCS. So uh, the next steps, as Alan indicated, uh, first is the comment period. Um, we're opening up a 30-day comment period uh, to assist us with the, this planning effort um, uh, in order to allow complete incorporation into the planning process. So any comments that, that you have or concerns, uh, we, we do want to hear from you and, and so that we can, again, incorporate those. Um, comments and concerns. Um, project status updates can be uh, found or will be found on the Bradford County PA website and the Chemung County New York website. Uh, those those uh, addresses are, are on the slide. Uh, we are anticipating a second public meeting date uh, this fall, uh, again, fall of 2021, and we're hoping to have the draft plan EA uh, completed in early 2022. Contacts, uh, myself, David Woloski, as well as Heather Smeltz. Uh, our contact information is listed here. Uh, for those comments, uh, questions, concerns, et cetera, uh, specific to this project, um, we ask that you email those directly to uh, bentleycreek at paracorp.com, that email address. So, Alan, uh, have we received any comments or questions in the chat box? Uh, I do not see any comments in the chat box. So if anybody has any questions, uh, you can feel free to, uh, to type them in now. Uh, we're happy to, uh, to answer those now. Uh, if you don't have it now, or if it comes to you later, uh, you can feel free to, again, email it to the, the address shown there at the bottom of the screen, bentleycreek at parkcorp.com, and we will get, a, get it incorporated into the planning process. Okay, so along with your comments and questions, anyone that may have any as we move forward, uh, if you have photographs of flooding uh, that you would like to share, that would be certainly appreciated as, whether, as, as well as any high water indicator marks. Uh, again, photos would be, would be great. And uh, damages, uh, flood, flood damages that you may have experienced, uh, we certainly would like to, uh, to receive some of that information. Uh, finally, uh, what would a successful project look like for you as, you know, a resident of Bradford County um, and or Chemung County um, it, within the Bentley Creek watershed? Uh, is it controlling the two-year storm, the five-year, the 10, 50, 100, et, et cetera? And, and what does that look like for you? What does that, what do those elevations mean uh, in relationship to your property? Uh, do you need to move? You know, that's often a question that that uh, uh, you certainly would like to have an answer. Uh, and it's very important that the public provide questions, comments, concerns uh, throughout this process, uh, so that we, as as NRCS and uh, uh, Pair Corporation, that that we're not we're not conveying only what we think you want to hear or we think you might want. Uh, so we definitely uh, welcome, again, any comments or questions uh, that you may have directly to the Bentley Creek, Creek at paracorp.com email address shown on the screen. Uh, David, so we did just get a question here. Do we anticipate whether recommendations may differ from those developed previously? Well, I'll, um, certainly, I'll certainly take an initial um, stab at that. Uh, no, we do not. Um, uh, we do not anticipate that the preferred, that the alternatives that were previously um, uh, developed will, uh, we anticipate they will be the same or very similar. Uh, we do anticipate uh, that the preferred alternative um, may may very well be the preferred alternative that uh, um, is uh, is the, the the outcome for this planning effort. Alan, do you want to take uh, add anything in addition to that, or Heather Smeltz from NRCS? Yeah, I mean, so in general, I, my my initial 
reaction would probably be yes, uh, but at the same time, I don't want to jump to that conclusion. You know, so since the previous study was done, there's been a lot of improvements in, in our modeling software. Uh, there's been changes in rainfall. There's been changes in the, the economic uh, um, values that need to be considered. Um, you know, and they, they train the train, the, the information about the, the ground surface and the contours and what the, the drainage area looks like, all big, big steps since the, the previous study was done. So you know, while our initial kind of gut check might say that it's going to be the same, uh, we don't want to go into this thinking that it's going to be the same. We want to go into it with kind of open eyes to make sure that we give it a fair assessment based upon what we know now about the, the drainage area. Alan, I'll just chime in and add um, that this is a brand new planning effort, even though, you know, we do have a document available. Uh, this is a new effort. Uh, any every, Anything and everything is on the table. All right, well, I guess if there aren't any more questions or uh, comments at this point, uh, we can wrap up tonight's session. Uh, we certainly thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, look forward to receiving any additional questions or, or comments or suggestions that you might have. Uh, again, we do want to stress that this is a, a public process and we uh, we want the public's input. Uh, we want that feedback. Uh, we want to make this a, a community program, not a uh, uh, an engineered program. <laughs>